you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We'll be looking at the first 11 verses there of the title of today's message is Jesus' Triumphant uh, Entry. Jesus' Triumphal Entry. Entry. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, you're welcome to do that. And we have that outline there for you. Let me give you that outline. Number one, the fulfillment of prophecy. His triumphant uh, entry fulfilled prophecy. Number two, the reaction of the people. There were two kinds of reactions that day. Two kinds, and we will share that with you in just a few minutes. And number three, the message of what's to come. Oh, folks, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And I understand we are in this world and we have a purpose in this world and God has left you in this world for a purpose. But in the grand scheme of things, I am telling you, either your death or the rapture of the church is going to be the best day of your life. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You know, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, It is also the beginning of Holy Week, which some people call Passion Week, which starts a week before Easter Sunday. Holy Week is a series of events that took place the last week of Jesus' life. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem for the last time. Holy Thursday was the Last Supper and the betrayal of Judas. Good Friday was the arrest and trial and crucifixion and the death and burial of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus went to Jerusalem because it was, t- it was a time of the Jewish feast called Passover. It was the most celebrated feast of the year, and there could have been as many as one to two million people in Jerusalem that week. Let's look at Matthew's perspective on Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is truly the most significant coronation uh, the world has ever seen because Jesus Christ, the one and only true King of kings and Lord of lords, was crowned king. And here's the deal, folks. Whether they crown him king and acknowledge that or not, we in Christ, Christendom, crowns him king of kings and Lord of lords. So let's look at the fulfillment of prophecy. Matthew 21.1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem, and if you look right above you, uh, Jesus was headed from Jericho to Jerusalem. Uh, It was about 25 miles, and he spent most of his time, his ministry in Galilee and around the Sea of Galilee. But he knew uh, this was the place Uh, that he was going. And when you think about it, in his life, he avoided contact and really public exposure his three years in ministry. He would heal someone, and remember what he would say? He said, don't tell anybody what I just did. Why? Because his time had not come yet. He knew this day was coming. He was so in tune with his heavenly Father that he knew exactly when this needed to take place. And he really was. He spent his three years thinking about the cross and walking towards the cross and knowing the date and the time of of going to Jerusalem. And it says, uh, now they would be the disciples, obviously drew near Jerusalem, and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. And again, the Mount of Olives on the east side. And when you went up this place, it was the highest point there. And you could look over Jerusalem. So it's, it's like he could see it coming uh, and, and know what he is going to. And then Jesus sent two of disciples, and you, you can you know kind of guess who it was, my, my opinion is it was Peter and John. Peter, because he was the spokesperson and always had, you know, he was always talking. He, he probably thought he might make some negotiation or something, all right? Then John was Jesus' best friend or, or actually his closest friend. So in my opinion, that was the two disciples. And saying to them, 
Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And what is amazing to me about this is, again, seeing the de- deity of Jesus Christ. Okay, He could have had those two tied on the road they're going, but he knew where this, this donkey was and the foal was. He gave them specific instructions. And folks, that's what Jesus could do. He read people's minds. He knew what the scribes and the Pharisees were thinking. And he gave specific instructions for these two disciples, knowing that he had a plan. And folks, that plan in this particular case was to fulfill prophecy. All through the Old Testament is biblical prophecy. And every one of the things that has been uh, laid out there, everything that you see had come true. And so many times, just like in the Scripture that we'll see in just a few minutes, I mean, they're taking it right out of the Old Testament, and it was put into the New Testament and applied to Jesus and His life. So we see, folks, the Bible is true. The Bible is inerrant. There is nothing false about the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is the truth. It is the faithful. And we need to believe the Bible, not what man's opinion is. And verse 3 says, And if anyone says anything to you, and it's kind of funny, I, I think Jesus had a smile on his face, You say, the Lord has needed them, and immediately uh, he will send them. So Jesus knew where they were. Jesus knew that someone was going to ask a question. I mean, folks, if I was owning the donkeys, I was thinking, these guys are stealing my donkeys. All right? So Jesus, knowing exactly what was going on, just tell them, hey, the Lord needs them. And you know what that means? One of two things. They were either Christians and believers, or Jesus, you know, the, the, the second thing is they trusted in this man named Jesus. Because, folks, as you will see in just a few minutes, everyone by this time knew who Jesus was. I didn't say everyone was saved, I did not say everyone followed Christ, because they didn't. He had much opposition. But God chose these folks. In history, God chose them for this time in history to fulfill a prophecy that was written 500 years before this happened. Folks, that's God. God is sovereign. God is almighty. God can do anything He chooses to do. Then look in verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And there's much in this. And and again, Matthew uh, was quoting Zechariah 9.9. And I want you to go there. Because he's quoting it, but he didn't write down all that this said. It wasn't a mistake on his part. He just picked up uh, you know, the main parts of that. But I want, I want you to see this prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Here's the first part. Rejoice greatly. That was not in what Matthew wrote. O daughter of Zion. Why are they rejoicing? Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He is is coming to Jerusalem. He is celebrating the Passover. He is coming to die for you and I. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. And why do you shout? Folks, we shout because we're excited. We shout as, as saying amen. We shout in celebration of things. Behold, your king is coming, which was in Matthew. And then the third thing that was, that, that was here and not there, he is just and having salvation. Oh, folks, I am telling you, he is just. He is fair. He has come to die for the sins of the world. And then the last two was quoted, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt in the foal 
of a donkey. And one of the things, when you think about donkeys, and I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit of it. I was 13 years old, and we were in Binger, Oklahoma. And we had some friends there. We'd go there every summer, two of my cousins, and we would meet there. And one time, we went out to their farm, and there were donkeys in this pen. And one of the guys said to me, one of y'all need to ride one of these donkeys. And we looked at each other, and they decided, I was the youngest, you need to ride the donkey. I had no clue what was about to happen. They got that donkey against that fence. They said, you got the rain there, you just hang on, and you'll go for a ride. The next thing I knew, I plopped down on that donkey. That donkey jumped away from the fence. I flew through the air and rolled, and they are all on the ground laughing at me and, 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 and rolling and just said, I guess that donkey didn't want you to ride it. You say, Mike, why do you tell that story? Because of Jesus. You think about this. This donkey was the foal. This was the young one. So even Mark said it had never been written. But folks, I'm just telling you, folks, Jesus can handle it, all right? If he needed to be a cowboy, he'd be a cowboy. My point, all right? There was, it, turn to Luke, Luke 8. Look at Luke 8. I want you to see this. Jesus showed them before that this is no problem. Luke 8, verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into the boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was great calm. Folks, Jesus knows what he's doing. Everything he did in those three years, he did it for a specific reason and a purpose. And here, he was giving the, the disciples a lesson in faith. In faith. Because he says, he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who could this be? i tell you who it was. It was King Jesus. It was the Messiah. It was God in human flesh. It was God who knew everything. It was deity. And he spent those three years pouring his life into them, showing them the miracles so that when he went on, they were eyewitnesses of what he did. And it says, for he commands even the winds and the water, and they obeyed them. And folks, that's why I look at this scripture here, and I'm just saying, that is an amazing thing. Jesus can do anything. He, he think, and, and think about the timing of all this. It was his timing. It was his time. He chose. He chose this time. God ordained every one of his steps. And he was just following through, obeying his heavenly Father. Then verse 6 says, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt and laid the clothes on them and set him on them. And as you see, folks, there was a specific reason and purpose why uh, Jesus was doing this. When you look at coronations, we are talking, and, and folks, we don't have a monarchy. We don't have a king, and so we don't really have you know, a, a vivid picture of, you know, you can see England and you can see other places that has this. But when you talk about a coronation, it was a huge thing, okay? And when you think about a donkey, they always rode in on white stallions. Why a donkey? It shows the humility of Jesus Christ. See, he didn't come in there with pomp and circumstance. He didn't come in there saying, look at me. He went in there, folks, to let people know and let the scribes and Pharisees know he's here. And you know what he literally did? He put pressure on them. 
He was pressuring them into doing exactly what he had came to do. This story here is just amazing. And people pass by it uh, before Easter. And I'm just telling you, I've been studying this for almost a month now, looking at every uh, move that he made. And folks, it was all written and, and divine from God. It was from God himself. It was showing, and, and the reason the people gathered also was because what they thought, even his disciples, some of them thought, because they were talking about who's being the greatest in the kingdom, they thought Jesus was going to ride in and he was going to take over the Roman government. But that was not his point. And do you realize he could have done that if he chose to and if God wanted him to do that? But folks, he rode on a donkey because he was a humble servant. He came to die, not to showboat. And that's what they are saying here. And you see this was all set up so that the scribes and the Pharisees would arrest him and he would go through Passion Week. So we see here, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. And not only that, we see the reaction of the people. The reaction of the people. Look at verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before, them, before and those who followed crying out saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When it says a great multitude, you think of somewhere between one and two million people being there. So if I'm, and, and again, I, this is just my personal opinion, there could have been on that road and following him as many as, of, as 100,000 people. Okay, why? Because of his miracles. There were some there, I'm sure, not too far you know, where Jesus wrote, Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. You know that got around. You know they said you would not believe what this, what this man, this Jesus, had done. It's crazy what he'd done. And Lazarus was there also. Matter of fact, there's an indication that these scribes and Pharisees wanted to arrest Lazarus too. And all he did was die and rose again, all right? But because... They saw them as Jesus' followers. Folks, I don't, you, I don't think you understand how, how much the scribes and the Pharisees hated Jesus Christ. And for him to make this public display here, it went all over them. And to see a following like that, that would be a parade where you're walking down the streets and the sidewalks are just filled for, I mean, for a mile or two miles. And, and, and it's just people are just hollering and, hollering and, and shouting things. And, and it, it calls a public spectacle, folks. And, and it made the scribes and Pharisees, they got very upset over it. And they threw clothes on the road. And that's what they did when kings came in. All right? The disciples uh, set a coat. And that was uh, Jesus' saddle on the foal or the donkey. But yet they kept putting their clothes down, and, and what that literally meant was they were submitting to this king. And so you could just see where, uh, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees would be almost at a boiling po point seeing this. And the others cut down branches from the trees. And again, we know they were palm branches. That's why we call this Palm Sunday. This was a week before Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And palm leaves and palm branches was thrown. It was a time of celebration. It was a time when, when people was just, uh, you know, they were just going all out for Jesus. Then verse 9, Then the multitudes went before and followed and said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. And again, I think we had two different things going here. What Jesus was thinking, Jesus was talking about, I'll save you, I'm going to save your soul. 
Whereas many that were there was saying, this is our king. He will overthrow the government. He will overthrow people, and, and he will be in charge. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were giving Jesus their blessings. And it says, Hosanna in the highest. Save us now. The highest means superior. Reign over everyone. Total control of everything that goes on. And you could see where the scribes and the Pharisees would go crazy about that. Psalm 119. Go with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I want you to see an expanded version of this in the Old Testament. Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 118.19. I said that wrong. Psalm 118.19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which righteousness shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The one that they wanted to kill, the one that they hated, folks, he is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Folks, my favorite day of the week is Sunday. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, pray, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord, for we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And you can see that psalm. You can see that quotation. So it's not just a fulfillment of one prophecy. It was a fulfillment of two prophecies. He is triumphal entry. But you know what? Just four days later, four days later, the, some of the same people that was crying Hosanna was crying, crucify him. Hold your finger there and go to John 19. John 19 with me. John 19, verse 13. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and set him down at the judgment seat in the place that is called pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Just days earlier, they were crying Hosanna, and they were worshiping him, and they were calling him their king. And here they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Folks, I am telling you, they, in four days, totally changed. The people changed their thoughts. And the people fell prey to uh, Pilate and to those of uh, the Sanhedrin that was judging Jesus Christ. So there we see two different reactions. We see coming in to Jerusalem, just celebration, just celebration, the coronation of a king. And then four days later, they want to crucify our Lord and Savior so we see the fulfillment of prophecy. We see the rea reaction of people. And now I want, to, I want you to see the message is of what is to come. And verse, verse 10, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And I answered that question earlier. It is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, of Galilee. What does that tell you? They've already changed their mind. Before he was a king, now he is a prophet. 
And folks, it just shows how quickly the tables can change. It just shows what emotional decisions will get you. It'll just show shows what the world is looking for. For they're they're looking not for a savior capital S, but a savior little s, which basically means a little s savior will give you whatever you want to control you. And here we see them turning and calling him a prophet. But folks, I am telling you, three days later, after they crucified Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords rose from the dead. And when we look at what is to come, folks, I've got news for you, folks. The second coming of Jesus Christ Jesus will be recognized for who He is and what He has done for us. Everyone, everyone in the city was affected by this. Many knew uh, the history behind Jesus and what what He was about. They knew about His ministry and His miracles. But the the, uh, Jewish leaders had a plan And that plan included Judas Iscariot. But folks, I'm telling you, and here's why I said what I said at the first of the service, the the best is yet to come. Go with me in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Let me tell you what's going to happen. All right? The next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And folks, I believe it could happen any time. Any time. Everything you see in Matthew chapter 24 has already come to pass. And by the way, folks, I hope you know a little prophecy. Russia and China are going to be right in the middle of it. It's lining up. It's happening, folks. And don't mistake the rapture of the church for the second coming. Many people mistake that. The rapture of the church will happen first. And when they're raptured out of here, all right, The Antichrist, the little S Savior, is going to come and make things right and set up a kingdom and everything's going to be good for about three and a half years. And then the Antichrist, and and again, we're talking about the tribulation period. That's what will happen. And then halfway through, the Antichrist will come and he will turn. And I'm telling you, it will be the worst, the great tribulation, it'll be the worst time known to mankind. And I'm I'm saying we will be up in heaven and people will be down here and, and it will just be, you know, the bowls and the judgments and all those things that are coming uh, that are coming. It's going to happen, folks. Read Revelation. And then at the end of the uh, the tribulation period, Jesus is coming. This will be his second coming. And John, while he was on the island of Patmos, he, he recorded all these things. It was a, as if God opened the screen, opened the doors, and shown John the book of Revelation. In the last battle, folks, it is the battle of Armageddon. And this is what he is talking about here. This same Jesus that rode in on a donkey will come on a white horse. Look at verse 11 in 19. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. A white horse, it it would be probably a white stallion. Uh, Again, that's what kings, that's what rulers uh, rode on. And he who sat on, on him was called faithful and true. Folks, that's Jesus. He's always been faithful. Always been true. His word is true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He makes war, folks. I am telling you, it's going to be a time of judgment. It's going to be a time of judgment. His eyes were like flames of fire. We know what flames of fire do. It destroys. And on his head were many crowns. Why? Because he will defeat every country, every leader 
in the known world will be defeated by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he had a name written no one knew except himself. And it'd be silly for me to say what that name might be because no one knows, all right? He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And some people, and and they're split on this, some people think it was his blood. But folks, if you read this, he's, he's destroying things. All right, We're talking the battle of Armageddon here. We're talking about where the blood rose up, halfway up a horse there. I believe it's the blood of folks, that, that is my opinion, that died in the battle of Armageddon. And his name is called the Word of God. We know his Word is living. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white linen, followed him on white horses. And folks, we don't follow him. I mean, we're on white. We are not having to do the battle. Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus has already won the war. He's already won. He don't need our help. His tongues, it was like swords, it said. His eyes were like flames of fire. Judgment will fall on the earth. And I'm telling you, he will destroy every enemy. He will destroy lost folks. He will destroy Satan. He will take them and he will throw them into the bottomless pit in hell forever and ever and ever. And it will usher in the millennium kingdom of God. Peace will follow. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with that, it should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod iron. Yes, he is merciful. Yes, he is patient. But I'm telling you, this is the end. Matter of fact, if you'll read Matthew 24 and you see all them things, the next verse right there says, the end is not yet. This is the end of the world known to mankind. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, my friend, he doesn't need our help, but I'll tell you who's coming. Christians are coming. Those who died during the tribulation period are coming with him. The Old Testament folks are coming with him. And and, uh, the angels, the holy angels, are coming with him. See, the difference between the rapture, he's meeting us in the air. The rapture, we're going up. The second coming, he's coming down and he will destroy the earth as we know it. Folks, I'm not telling you this to scare you one bit. I'm telling you this because you think about that. When he came in, what did they give him? They gave him a crown of thorns. What is he going to have? He'll have every one of those crowns. He will be ruler of supreme. When he came in, and you think of his modesty, he was born in a manger. Folks, I'm telling you, he's taken us back to heaven with us. When he came in, many people rejected him, did not believe his message. They called him Beelzebub and a lot of other names. But I got news for him. When, they, when he comes back, He will come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus is Lord. Folks, that is our Jesus. We win. We win. The deal today, and I close with this, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Folks, I'm telling you, it could happen today. The rapture of the church could happen today. And if you don't know him, I am telling you, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is Passion Week. This is Passion Week. Would you just determine in your heart of hearts that you are going to treat this week different than you have done before. And as we go into Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, 
I pray that your total focus will be on Jesus Christ our Lord. Some here today may need to rededicate their life to Christ. Our altars are always open. You can come down anytime. If you came down during the sermon, it wouldn't upset me, folks. When someone needs to do business with God, let them go. Let them do that. When we talk about you know, being a part of the, the church, folks, we are the chosen people of God. We have reason to rejoice. We have reason to celebrate. Our God is alive. Jesus is coming, and I'm a child of His. You talk about a triumphant entry. Folks, I am telling you, He is going to make the entries of all entries when the, you know, when the end of the world comes. And I pray, I pray to God that you are ready. Father, thank you. Thank you for Passion Week. Thank you, God, that, Lord, uh, even the last verse we read, King of kings and Lord of lords, God, you are our God. You are coming for us. And God, I thank you for that promise. And God, I pray that even this week as we focus on you, God, I pray that we would realize how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. God, I pray that we would do our best to get family here, to get friends here, neighbors here, to celebrate Easter Sunday with the church. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray, I pray that they would come down and talk to us and we can talk to them about giving their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that hearts would be right with you. I pray that we would just totally focus on you this next week. Lord, if there's some that need to come for baptism or even the church letter or joining the church by statement, God, I pray that you would uh, use that. And God, I pray your Holy Spirit would tell them what they need to do. God, thank you. Thank you for the triumphant entry. Thank you for Jesus' life. Thank you for the cross. And thank you that we're going to spend all eternity with Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?